So, um, my wife called me last night and she said uh, my timing was excellent. So I fled to South America before the United States presidential election was done. So I've been here the last week. So as you know, we had a, a small election this week and so we'll have a new president coming up soon. What I want to talk about in this lecture, ah, gracias. are the signs and symptoms of urea cycle. I like how they laid out this. We'll talk about signs and symptoms, diagnosis, cases, what they look like. Then we'll talk some about treatment and then about the nutritional management. But if you cannot diagnose the disease, if you cannot recognize that a patient has a problem, then the rest of it never happens. So the signs and symptoms are very important. And of course, the basic concept slide of metabolism is that you have a block in a pathway and you have an accumulation of substrate, in the case of urea cycle ammonia, and you don't make product. In the case of the urea cycle, you don't make citrulline, arginine, urea, depending on where the block is. These are some of my patients over the years. Um, some are still with us, some are no longer still with us. But uh, it's been one of the great joys of my life to treat patients with urea cycle disorders. So what can you do with ammonia? Ammonia is kind of the key to the whole thing. You can use it to make rocket fuel. You can use it to make uh, a cleaner. You can clean floors and windows with it. You can use it as fertilizer. And as my mother told me, she said anything you can use to clean a floor is probably not good for your brain. This, of course, is the cycle. It has five primary enzymes. It takes ammonia, converts it through a series of steps into urea, the majority of the ammonia clearance takes place in the liver, but there are other tissues involved as well, and those become important later on. The other thing to remember is that the urea cycle is the body's primary source for arginine. Without urea cycle, arginine becomes an essential amino acid. This is something when we first started treating patients many years ago, we didn't know, and many of our patients did not do very well until we remembered to start giving them arginine. So what things will interrupt the urea cycle? So we will see now how well Google did as far as translating goes. If I hear a laughter, um, then I know it not so well. Um, rare genetic defects, which is the topic today we're going to talk about. Um, viruses, um, toxins such as alcohol or chemicals. Hypoxia and shock. Bypass for cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, other metabolic diseases, galactosemia, tyrosinemia, Wilson's disease, and others. Um, vascular bypass of the liver, um, and then other molecules such as valproic acid, um, the uh, cyclophosphamide, a common chemotherapy agent, organic acids such as from methylmalonic or propionic acid, and then many times what we'll see is a patient will have a partial urea cycle defect, but will then have one of these other challenges that will trigger it. How does ammonia affect the brain? The, most of the signs and symptoms we see originate from neurotoxicity. So the direct effect, if I apply ammonia directly to a brain cell or to more of an astrocyte or glial cell, it will swell. It affects the aquaporins of that cell um, and will cause physical swelling. One thing that's important to remember is it is not osmotic swelling. So the addition of external salts will have little effect on that swelling. Many people try to use um, mannitol and other things in treatment, but they really don't help much. It affects both excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. It will affect uh, expression of glutamate transporters, um, peripheral type benzodiazepine receptors, alpha ketoglutarate. Um, it will increase glutamine and glutamate and also affect the uh, um, pool of alpha ketoglutarate from the TCA cycle, so a number of biochemical effects, and then will also affect glutamine transport. Part of the problem with all of these effects is many of the molecules that affects in the amino acid pool also will have effects as neurotransmitters. So, you know, as like the simple amino acid glycine will have an effect as a neurotransmitter, glutamine also will have effects on the brain and on neurotransmission. The sources of data I want to talk about today come from a large study we did in the U.S. when we were looking at um, pharmacologic management of 260 patients. 
some of the French data from Necker, uh, some of Dr. Fumio Endo's data published by Dr. Uchino from Japan, and then our prospective uh, urea cycle disorders consortium. We're currently following 720 patients with urea cycle disorders since 2004, so we've been collecting longitudinal data. So as many of you know in rare disease, um, we do not always have the best evidence for what we try to do or what we think we are seeing. So this is one field where we're trying to correct that and add evidence uh, as we go along. So how common are these? They're rare. They're what we would call medium rare, which if you like steak means not pink, not well done. Um, about one in 35,000 overall. The most common far and away is ornithine transcarbamylase, which is X-linked. Um, ASS and ASL are actually our next most common urea cycle disorders uh, further down the pathway. So by diagnosis, OTC far and away is the most common. And the most common group in there are OTC carrier females who may or may not have symptoms. If we look at on age of onset um, and we just break it down into our neonatal patients and our late onset, one of the things we have found that was a little surprising for us is when I started in the field, the classic newborn presentation, the sick neonate who becomes hyperaminemic, we thought that was the majority of the presentations. As it turns out, the patients who are presenting with hyperaminemia, about 60 to 70 percent of them are presenting outside the newborn period. So as we learn more and more, um, we're finding older patients. My oldest patient presented for her first time, I believe at age 75, with hyperaminemia after having asthma and receiving intravenous steroids. So it is a lifetime disease for patients with partial defects that's usually combined with an environmental trigger for when they become sick. Of course, the newborns typically have the most severe mutations, the lowest amount of enzyme, but then you can have patients present later on. So, why newborns? Well, um, for one thing, they've spent about nine months having the mother be their biochemical filter. The placenta, ammonia will cross very easily. If the patient has a urea cycle defect, the mother can take care of that. She also can supply the citrulline and arginine that the patient needs. The other thing is the conversion from the fetal physiology to the postnatal physiology is extraordinarily stressful. Uh, suddenly, caloric expenditure increases dramatically, and patients will use multiple energy sources to supply, including protein. So they will begin to break down their own protein. That will liberate ammonia, which can cause problems. The other thing is, even at term, the enzymes of the urea cycle are only at about 40% of the levels they will be two to three weeks later. If a patient is born prematurely, it's even lower. A patient at 30 weeks gestation may only have 20 to 25% of the enzymes that they will have later. And then, of course, calorie expenditures. Infants spend more calories than they take in. It's why they commonly lose 10% of their birth weight. Again, they will often use protein as a source for this, releasing nitrogen and ammonia. So of the times of life that the stress will bring out urea cycle disorder, the newborn period, is one of those. So clinical presentation of a newborn. The, one of the dangers of this disease is the babies are born and they look perfectly normal. They look healthy, they're well formed, there's no dysmorphology. Um, and we have a push in the United States and I suspect elsewhere to send families home sooner and sooner. Uh, when I was born, I was in the hospital for probably about a week while my mom recovered very nicely and then went home. So skilled nurses used to watch patients in the nursery and could tell when they were not normal. What we're finding now is that when we send these children home much earlier, the patients go home with the parents. The baby is maybe sleepier than they should be, but the parents are exhausted, so they don't always notice. So I've actually found that over the last 25 years, my patients are now presenting sicker than they did when I started this. So sleepiness is kind of the first thing we'll notice in children. This can progress to a lethargy. The patients withdraw more and more and will eventually go into a coma. This correlates very well with the cerebral edema. So as the brain begins to swell, 
blood flow to the brain decreases. As the blood flow to the brain decreases, the brain will start to shut down to conserve resources. Uh, the other thing that patients will do is they will lose their thermoregulation. So it's very common for these children to come in very cold. Um, and of course, most a good pediatrician will immediately think the child has what? Sepsis. So in all of my years, I don't think I have a patient yet who is not already on antibiotics when they came to me. And that's okay, because um, sepsis is more common than urea cycle, by a little bit anyway. As they withdraw, as they slide more and more into a coma, they will start to lose, they will not feed. As they don't feed, they become more catabolic. They break down more of their own protein, the ammonia goes up, they become sleepier, they feed less. So we call this the downward spiral. These patients will very quickly become quite ill. Babies don't do a lot of neurologic posturing, but they will do some. Particularly, you may see a bowing of the patient, epistototinus. If you start to see neurologic posturing, that means that you have extreme degrees of cerebral edema and swelling. So one of the reasons children tend to survive urea cycle events better than adults is because of the sutures in the skull are not fully formed, so the brain has some elasticity around the skull. Later on, when the sutures fuse, there's less elasticity and the patients can die much faster. Um, hyperventilation and hypoventilation. This is something that you will see reported in the textbooks. You'll see it as a test, they, a question they often put on exams, but you have to be careful with this. As the brain begins to swell and blood flow decreases to the brain, carbon dioxide builds up in the brain. The sensors in the blood vessels in the brain say, breathe fast, decrease the CO2, and these patients will have an overdrive of their ventilation. The blood pH will increase. I think the highest I've seen was 7.7 7, 7 .7 on pH, but this does not last that long. So I've had physicians say, well, it can't be a urea cycle. They're not breathing fast and the pH is low. As the brain swells and pushes on the brain stem, at first you will get the hyperventilation, but eventually ventilation will cease and the patient will go into respiratory arrest as the brain stem is compressed. What about our older patients? So the majority of patients are now presenting outside the newborn period. Typically, there is an environmental trigger. These patients often have only a partial urea cycle defect. They have some function because of their genetic defect that does not completely destroy the enzyme. So there needs to be something else. What we notice if we take a history for these patients, when they get a viral infection or when they make a transition for sleeping overnight, they have, they're sicker than other patients will be. It takes them longer to recover. They're often sleepier. And sometimes we don't get this until they have a catastrophic event and then we look backwards. They do the same thing as the other patients. They become sleepy. They'll progress to coma. Once they've crossed that boundary of becoming hyperaminemic, they will be every bit as sick as the newborns present. They will disrupt their feeding, neurologic posturing. We tend to see more seizures in the older patients who are presenting with hyperaminemia. It's not really clear why that's the case, but we'll see maybe about twice the frequency of seizures there. So we looked at 260 patients, and then we went back and looked what were the symptoms and signs at their very first presentation. Um, and what we found is 100% of the patients presented with neurologic symptoms. Level of consciousness was always the most common. It was really at 100% because level of consciousness, the baby can be described as sleepy, level of consciousness, coma, all the same thing, but their connection to the world is decreased. Abnormal motor function, ataxia, was in about 30% of the cases, and seizures were in about 10 to 15% of the cases. Vomiting is a very early sign, but then decreases as the patient becomes more somnolent and the brain starts, stops functioning. Here is one of the dangerous findings we found. About 30% of the patients presented with an infection. So as our pediatricians were working them up for sepsis, they would find a bacteria, 
or a virus and think they were done. What had happened instead is the infection had triggered a partial urea cycle defect and the patients continued to progress and became sicker and sicker. So one of the things we do a lot of time working with our emergency room physicians, our intensive care unit physicians is to always get a pneumonia when they have a patient who has a change in their level of consciousness. We just keep saying that again and again and eventually it sticks for many of them. So even though the patient has an infection, don't stop, make sure you've checked a pneumonia. So we looked at the level of ammonia to see if that changed the frequency of the symptoms. What we found is, um, and these are in uh, micromoles per liter. I know many labs use milligram per deciliter here, but we can do the conversions. But what we found is that actually, once the ammonia crosses a certain threshold and starts to affect the brain, the level is not quite so important for how many symptoms they have. The decreased level of consciousness starts at very low ammonia levels and continues across higher ones. All of us who've cared for patients with urea cycle disorders where patients become very tolerant of elevated ammonia. This is just at the first presentation. I had patients who could have ammonia of three to 400 microliters and play a very good game of pool. But the majority of them will have decreased um, levels of consciousness. Adult onset disease. This is the part of the field that I think we neglect and have not looked at quite as much as we should have. Um, what are some of the triggers? A common seizure medication that is also used in psychiatry, it's used in migraine headaches, and is a very old drug, valproic acid or Depakote. It will directly interfere with the first enzyme in the cycle, carbamyl phosphate synthetase, and this has been a trigger for a number of hyperaminemic cases and actually a number of deaths. We have lost a number of mothers who were OTC carriers with partial effect after their delivery. They became catabolic um, and then went very rapidly into hyperaminemic coma after delivery. We have lost a partial urea cycle patient after a heart-lung transplant. Uh, short bowel and kidney disease has been another trigger in adults. Um, parenteral nutrition, a patient put on IV nutrition that has a very high nitrogen content has also triggered one of these. So I've, these are all from actual cases that we've seen over the years. GI bleeding is a cause because the protein from the blood that is put into the gut has to be resorbed and can drive the ammonia quite high. Trauma, particularly the break of a major bone. If you break a femur or a large bone, you will put into the third space a lot of blood as well as the resorption of a lot of muscle tissue that can also trigger a hyperaminemic episode. Gastric bypass surgery. We have at least five cases in the United States now where patients after having surgery for obesity have had massive catabolism and has triggered their underlying urea cycle defect. And we're actually looking at how can we screen these patients before surgery because all of them but one have died from their hyperaminemic crisis because they are just so catabolic. Um, high nitrogen dietary supplements. So in the United States, we have people who are bodybuilders. I imagine you have the same. They will take large amounts of protein supplements, huge amounts of nitrogen, and that can overwhelm their systems as well. One place where we've seen a growing number of these patients, and I think this is more recognition than anything, is in high dose chemotherapy particularly around bone marrow transplantation. Uh, the drug cyclophosphamide will directly interfere with urea cycle function, and we'll see all of these patients will have some small level of ammonia elevation, but in some of them it can be catastrophic. And then, of course, severe liver disease of almost any type will do this as well. What are the clues? If you take a history for a patient who's an adult who has a partial defect, they are almost all what we call an auto-selective vegetarian. Their body has trained itself not to eat much meat. They will, and where I come from in the southern United States, they are what we call biscuit eaters. Uh, whatever the highest starch food content you have here or in your country, that's probably what they like to eat and will avoid protein. When they get sick from a cold, a flu, they will have, be sicker than everyone else around them. All of the patients we've looked at, at least the majority of them who came in, were obese. Why? They avoid protein, but their body is continually hungry because they are not getting enough 
of their essential amino acids, so they will continually to eat. So obesity appears to be a part of that as well, too. Many of these patients will have behavioral and psychiatric illness, um, depression, psychosis, uh, all the different types, and we've actually seen some drug-seeking behavior in these patients as well, too. Sometimes there's a family history, but usually not. Since the majority of these diseases are recessive, um, they don't typically uh, give you a good family history. So that's sort of our intro for this. I think I might have even shaved a minute or two off of that, got us on track here. Um, and we'll do questions later on in that. But the main things to remember about signs and symptoms of urea cycle disorders is they can be at any age. They can be from any highly stressful trigger event. So um, the adult physicians, I knew uh, at my last university that I had succeeded when I walked into the adult intensive care unit and saw a urea cycle drawn on the uh, chalkboard over by the side. So then I knew it was time to move to a new university. My work was done there. Um, but they're going to rely on you to help them figure this out. The key thing is to, if you don't check a pneumonia, you won't know that the patient has this. So the sooner you can get people to reflexively check ammonia when a patient has a change in consciousness, the sooner you'll get to the patient and can treat them. Thank you.